Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's special program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Gloria Duffy, President and CEO of the club, and I'll be our moderator for this program today. We thank our audience for your ongoing support of the Commonwealth Club. If you'd like to make a donation, please text the word donate to 415-329-4231. For today's program, please submit your questions for our guests via the chat room next to your screen. I'll get to as many as possible of them later in the program. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's program and guests. Rebecca Listener, Assistant Professor at the U.S. Naval War College, and Mira Rapp Hooper, Senior Fellow at Yale Law School. They are co-authors of the new book, An Open World, How America Can Win the Contest for 21st Century Order. I'm also pleased to say that Rebecca was an intern at the Commonwealth Club about six years ago, and I want to congratulate her on her successful journey since then. In their new book, Rebecca and Mira paint a provocative picture of the United States future. As the country prepares for a presidential election of historic significance and charts its course in a post-pandemic world, they say the U.S. must reject the temptation to embrace nationalistic calls for closure, global disengagement, or self-sufficiency, and instead redouble our commitment to international leadership, economic interdependence, and alliances in an open world. They say that despite considerable foreign threats, the greatest dangers to the United States come from within. Decades of underinvestment in the American people, in our economy and our democracy, misalignment of the tech sector with the nation's vital interests, and acute partisan polarization. Today, we're going to have an engaging discussion on how the future of American power in a post-COVID world must build on the foundation of 21st century competitiveness. Welcome, Rebecca and Mira. Thank you so much, Gloria. It's wonderful to be with you. Thank you, Gloria. It's really a delight to be back with the Commonwealth Club. So let's start by asking both of you uh, a broad question, and briefly, because we'll get much more deeply into this as our discussion goes on. What do you mean by the title of your book, An Open World? Open in what sense? I'm happy to kick us off today, Gloria, um, in response to this great first question. The short answer is that Rebecca and I see there as being an international battle underway between forces of openness and forces of closure. We believe that the United States can only stay safe and secure and prosperous if it defends an open world. And that's what we argue in this book. Well before the COVID crisis, which of course have upended all of our last few months, the US-led international system was already under considerable strain. America's geopolitical edge was eroding as China continued to rise. U.S. tech companies were rejecting cooperation with Washington, while authoritarians like China and Russia used digital surveillance to tighten their grips. And the domestic political polarization in the United States eroded our power further from within. These trends all raised the specter of the fact that we could have a 21st century that was closed, in which authoritarian states ended American access to important waterways or trading hubs, cut off our access to friends and allies around the world, and ended our leadership atop important international institutions. And of course, the pandemic has only accelerated and deepened many of these forces, making it all the more likely that countries, including the United States, will increasingly seek safety by turning inwards, closing their borders and limiting travel, cutting themselves out from the outside world. But this would be a world that would be more dangerous for the United States. And the measures that we've had to put in place these last few months should, should not be our destiny. Rather, to lead the 21st century, the United States must pursue a strategy of openness that pioneers new forms of international cooperation in an open world. Rebecca, over to you. Absolutely. Well, Mira laid it out expertly. And why don't I take this opportunity to just share with our listeners what we exactly mean by an open world and what an openness strategy is. 
So an openness strategy is a new foreign policy vision that sets out to defend the United States' most vital interests and values, even though it is no longer the world's unrivaled superpower. And it recognizes exactly as Mira said, that the U.S. can only stay safe, secure, and prosperous in an open world. So what does that mean? An open world means that first, all states should be able to make free and independent political choices without foreign interference in their domestic decision-making processes and without outright domination by more powerful nations. Second, international waterways, airspace, and outer space must all remain open and accessible for commercial and military transit, which means that countries like China should not be able to restrict international transit through vital waterways like the South China Sea. And third, global cooperation and trade should proceed through international institutions that are governed transparently and modernized for 21st century challenges. And it's important to recognize that to realize these three pillars of an open world, the U.S. does not need to dominate the world militarily. It just needs to prevent other countries from doing so, while joining with like-minded allies and partners to build a powerful coalition for international openness. Thank you both. So um, what are the benefits that you see the U.S. has had as a result of policies of openness of the past? How, how has it benefited us over time? It's such an important question, Gloria. Openness um, in many ways has always been at the center of America's strategy in the world. But what we're calling for here is a new foreign policy that places it at a core focus. Um, for the United States, particularly as American power in the world is increasingly constrained. At least since the end of World War II, U.S. policymakers have always sought to keep the world open in some form. Uh, in the uh, immediate or, or uh, sorry, final days of World War II, FDR conceived of an open world as a way to end the Second World War and potentially continue cooperation with the Soviet Union, an aspiration which unfortunately was dashed when Stalin made it clear that he did not intend to cooperate with the West. But the reason that FDR sought openness was because only if countries or continents like Eurasia stayed open could the United States access the vital markets it would need to keep itself prosperous. Could it have the security ties it would need to allies to keep both the United States and those allies safe? Um, and only under those conditions could it access the waterways and skies that would allow it to navigate freely the world in ways that would allow for trade um, and allow for military access around the world. But although uh, Roosevelt's vision for openness during the Cold War did not come to be, the United States remained committed to a version of openness within its democratic sphere of influence throughout the Cold War. And after the end of the Cold War with the collapse of the Soviet Union, it saw almost no constraint on the idea of openness in the world. That is, sitting atop a newly powerful geopolitical position with no rival to contest its power, the United States faced almost no constraint to any action it might take on on the global stage. And sometimes that led to excess, things such as the invasion of Iraq. But in that world, the United States was able to trade freely, was able to connect with its security partners freely, and saw no challenges to navigating the seas or skies that are so vital to its security and prosperity. But now that China is not only rising, but largely has risen, the United States can no longer take openness as a guarantee. Rather, if it is to be able to continue to access the world in these ways that have been so beneficial to its safety and its prosperity, it's going to need to place openness at the center of its strategy in ways that it acknowledged there are these newfound constraints on its power, and yet place this at the centerpiece of its alliances and its approach to international institutions if the country is to stay safe and secure. Is part of your premise that because of our advantages as a society, our education, our resources, our, uh, our prowess in uh, business and commerce, that the U.S. does better in an economic environment, in an open environment, especially economically, because we tend to be more competitive? 
That is absolutely true, Gloria. And it's a really important point. When you think about the fact that 95% of global consumers are actually beyond American borders, it becomes very clear that if the U.S. is to be prosperous, uh, we need to be engaged in an open and interdependent international system and international economic system. But it's not just dollar and cents. It's also our security that is at stake here. Because if a hostile adversary were to come to dominate crucial regions of the world, that would mean that the United United States would find itself threatened. And we saw in World War I and World War II what happened when the United States tried to retreat behind its own oceans and behind its own borders and had to intervene late in two world wars. Uh, because at the end of the day, American security and our prosperity are inextricably linked with that of the world. Now, it's also the case that openness, as we define it, as it relates to international cooperation, is also vital. And this speaks to the health and safety of everyday Americans. We are living through right now a pandemic that illustrates how many threats that Americans face in a very immediate way emanate from overseas, but they also can only be addressed through international cooperation that transcends borders. But the problem is that the architecture of international cooperation that was built in the 1940s is simply not suited to the challenges and the opportunities of the 2040s. Challenges like pandemics, challenges like climate change, challenges like like cybersecurity and internet governance. We have a structure that's becoming rapidly outmoded and ill-fit to the most important challenges that we face. So a critical pillar of an openness strategy too is the renovation of those legacy institutions and the construction of new ones so that the United States can keep itself, its allies and its partners safe, secure and prosperous in an open world. Can you say a little bit about how these structures need to be updated or new structures need to be built to deal with the increasingly globalized challenges like climate change, pandemics, et cetera. Absolutely. As Rebecca already alluded to, um, when we talk about international organizations, experts sometimes use the shorthand international order. And that refers to the international norms, institutions, and rules that generally govern international politics. Um, in the current day, the institutions that we're usually referring to, like the United Nations, for example, were largely set up in the immediate years following the Second World War with the United States at their helm. But of course, much has changed in the world since these institutions were first architected and power in this international system has changed along with them. And because institutions like the United Nations are ultimately propped up by the power of their leaders, it shouldn't surprise us that some of these changes mean that these institutions are no longer fit to the world that we're facing. Now, I'll give you just a few examples. Um, one is the World Trade Organization. Um, of course, this is the main international institution that governs global trade um, that has been incredibly important in facilitating international cooperation and lowering barriers to beneficial trade over the course of decades. But after China acceded to the World Trade Organization in the early 2000s, only then did we come to understand that the organization was not properly equipped to deal with some real challenges that China presented to the international economy, such as uh, its use of intellectual property um, and the fact that the World Trade Organization doesn't govern digital services. But there's no way to change the World trade organization except by mutual consent of all of its members. And now that China's inside, it's not eager to alter the rules that are working in its favor, in many ways allowing China to exploit the economic openness of other societies, even though it keeps its economy partially closed. So part of the challenge here is to figure out how to renovate international institutions like the World Trade Organization to bring them up to speed. But there are other areas such as the internet and cyberspace where there are almost no rules at all that govern these new technologies that we care about so much. Many of the regimes that do exist are only piecemeal, they're in their earliest stages and they're not binding on the most relevant countries involved. So there is a charge before the United States and its allies, not only to renovate institutions like the WTO, but to create new forms of governance in these all important areas like 
like technology and climate change. Because if it fails to do so, it can bank on the fact that China and other countries that support China's closed preferences will write those rules instead. Uh, Rebecca, any thoughts? Or I have more questions if, if not. Sure, I'm happy to jump in here. And I just want to underline one point that I think we've alluded to repeatedly, but ought to be stated explicitly, which is that the reason why the United States can no longer pursue the same post-Cold War foreign policy that it has been pursuing for so long is because its position in the world has changed irreparably. And the reason that its position in the world has changed so much is because of the rise of China. China has experienced meteoric economic growth over the past several decades. It is now the world's largest economy by some measures, and its military has expanded in parallel. And while China itself rose within a U.S.-dominated international environment, it now seeks to change that environment and to write new rules of the road for 21st century international politics that better reflect China's own power and preferences. And so when we lay out this openness strategy, both the necessity for it and the content of it, it's important to recognize that the chief antagonist of openness that we identify is China. And that is because China is the only country in the world that both has preferences for closure and the means to bring that closure about. And that closure could come about in a number of different ways. It might take a 19th century kind of form whereby China actually uses military force to annex its contiguous neighbors um, or even ta Taiwan. But it also might take a subtler 21st century form in which China uses digital infrastructure, physical infrastructure, or new technologies as a means to assert its dominance over other states, whether in Asia or overseas, to coerce the political leaders of those states, uh, to suborn local officials, to spy upon them. Uh, and so we need to be attuned to both of these kinds of threats that are emanating from China. And it requires a different set of American responses because it's no longer going to be sufficient to just rely on American military power to deter Chinese aggression. We also need to match China in these new spaces, whether technological, economic, commercial, or ideological. So an openness strategy is responsive to the full spectrum threat that China does pose. And this new condition of international politics that is frequently referred to as great power competition, that is the resurgence of rivalry between very powerful states in the international system, where the U.S. is no longer far and away the dominant and uncontested superpower. Underlying what you're saying, it's, it seems as though to prevent any country from being a hegemon, China or otherwise, uh, and constraining this environment of, uh, of openness and threatening the U.S. role in an open world, uh, we must maintain a strong defense. We must maintain our defense spending. I mean, what does our security policy look like to keep the openness open so that we can compete well in it? It's such an important question, Gloria. As Rebecca alluded to in her last answer, it certainly is true that keeping the world open requires defense spending and thinking about the prospect of military competition. But competition in the 21st century is not just occurring in military form. And in many ways, it's occurring in other forms primarily, such as economic and technological forms. And if the United States is to keep the world open and maintain a leadership role, it's going to need to focus there as well. Um, first things first, however, is that for the United States to keep the world open, it will not just need to think about its own defense budget or even its foreign policy budget. It will need to reinvest in itself. The primary determinant of the U.S. role in the world and the question of whether or not the United States can stay strong enough to support a strategy of openness will be whether or not the United States reinvests in itself. There, we're thinking about policies that support education, um, that certainly uh, prioritize our recovery from COVID, uh, that transition the United States to a sustainable and green economy, that support immigration, and that foster our base of innovation so that we can continue to be the powerful country we should be in the 21st century. Because only then do we have the capability to start enacting this strategy. 
But alongside that, we not only want to see us prioritize a robust defense, as you suggest, Gloria, but think about how our national security budget and priorities should be positioned more broadly. If China were to close off parts of the international system, it almost certainly would not prioritize doing so with the in military instrument first and foremost. Rather, it would do so using economic coercion or even new technologies like 5G telecommunications technology to siphon off data and spy on foreign countries by building their digital infrastructure. So if the United States is going to compete in that world and keep it open, it's going to need to prioritize its State Department, its Treasury Department, its development funding, all of these tools of foreign policy that have been deprioritized in recent years, but are so essential to the United States role in the world outside of the military domain. Only if we remake those aspects of our foreign policy and reinvest in diplomacy as the primary instrument of American foreign policy, will we have the chance to make good on an openness strategy like this one. That's a critical point. And if I could just embroider upon it for a moment, I think it's important to recognize that all of these domestic investments are absolutely crucial. And they show that the traditional distinction that we've made between foreign policy and domestic policy is simply no longer operative in the 21st century, where so much of America's international strength depends fundamentally on our domestic strength. But there's another piece of this too, which is even if the US makes all the right choices at home, it nevertheless cannot keep the world open on its own. We need to work with allies and partners. And there, allies, especially in Europe and in Asia, are tremendous assets for the United States. Together with our allies, we have something on the order of 28 times the GDP that China has. So that's something that will be really hard for China to overcome if we all stay lashed up together and act in defense of openness, both in Asia and in Europe. And so much of the success of this strategy will depend on the decision of our allies to join us in backing institutional reform efforts in places like the WTO and the UN Security Council, in joining with us to set new rules and norms to govern the internet and emerging technologies, in upgrading their own defense strategies to protect the global commons, and in the case of Europe, in joining with the US in seeking to push back against China in Asia, in addition to pushing back against Russia in Europe. So it's really important to recognize recognize that the domestic piece of this is absolutely vital. It is necessary, but it's also insufficient because this is a global battle underway between openness and closure. And our friends are a crucial element of the winning coalition that will be required to succeed in these efforts. Well, speaking of that, one of our audience members would like to know which countries the U.S. should prioritize in re rebuilding our relationships. It's, it's a great question, um, and we're afraid uh, that with the extent of the damage that has been done in recent years, there will be a need for the United States to press forward on multiple fronts at once. That is, we will not have the luxury of simply picking and choosing amongst a few vital relationships, but we'll have to reprioritize our alliances overall. Exactly as Rebecca has indicated, a primary source of our strength is our treaty allies in Europe and Asia. That is our 30 NATO allies, um, a huge uh, base of support, um, both in economic and military and political terms, as well as our five treaty allies in East Asia, all of whom have really been the um, sort of geopolitical source of America's strength in both regions for many decades. But if the United States is to rebuild its relationships with its allies in the years to come, it's going to need to do more than simply recommit to them and announce that it's back on the global stage. It's going to need to remake these alliances to face down some of the threats and challenges that we've been talking about here today. It's going to need to cooperate with its allies to face down climate change on the global health response to COVID, to cooperate to produce technological alternatives to China's 5G systems, and to improve defenses in cyberspace and against political interference like Russia's disinformation campaigns and election meddling. So it won't simply be enough to restore ourselves to the alliance system that the United States left a few years ago. Rather, Washington will have to take up the charge to remake that system for this world of far greater and more diverse challenges we're facing if it is to be equipped to help us on this way forward. 
So timing is interesting here. Um, we're in the throes of the last month of our presidential election, and this looks like it could be a strategy for a new administration. Uh, often there is a kind of a unifying concept. When I was served in the Clinton administration, engagement was our byword, and that had some real meaning in terms of how we approach things. Um, what's the significance of your timing? Could this strategy be implemented by uh, another uh, another uh, four years of the current administration? Does it require a change? And then how would it be implemented? How, how would it play out? So the question of time and Gloria is so critical because the United States faces a small and narrowing window of opportunity to remake its foreign policy before it is too late. And we find ourselves today at probably the most consequential geopolitical crossroads than our, that our, our country and the world have faced at least since the end of the Cold War and maybe since the end of World War II. And the fact is that the U.S. remains exceptionally powerful and with sufficient political will can turn this moment of destruction into a moment of creation. So that is the opportunity that either candidate, whoever wins in November, will face going forward. I think speaking to the specifics of an openness strategy, it's certainly a lot easier to imagine in a Biden administration than it is in a Trump administration. If you look at many of the core tenets of the openness strategy, we were just talking about alliances, we've been talking about trade, we've been talking about investing in innovative multilateralism. These are all elements of foreign policy that are pretty antithetical to Donald Trump's worldview. We know that he's antagonistic towards allies, he has antipathy towards trade, and so on. So it's hard to see. But that being said, this administration has made a centerpiece of their national security strategy, great power competition with China and to a lesser extent with Russia. And if they're serious about competing with China, I think that they're going to have to look at the elements of an openness strategy very closely because whatever the president may think about alliances, for all the reasons we've already discussed, the geopolitical math over the next several decades is not in America's favor unless we work with our allies. So if it's going to succeed in competing with China, it ought to adopt something that resembles an openness strategy. Now, if Biden wins in November, I think there is a different set of challenges that this strategy could face. The fact is that a Biden administration on its first day in office will inherit a health crisis, an economic crisis, a climate crisis that's being felt so acutely out there in California, uh, a racial justice crisis, and in many ways, a democratic legitimacy crisis. So it's going to be easier for a Biden administration in many ways to try to restore rather than reimagine American foreign policy. Uh, but that would be a mistake because the pre-2016 status quo uh, is not the world that Biden will inherit and it's not the world that we will find over the next few decades. And so our, ho our hope and our intent is to try to influence this conversation um, in such a way that American policy is pushed in the direction of openness. Uh, I'll let Mira describe maybe in more practical terms what the various policy pillars of an openness strategy would be. Absolutely. Um, Rebecca just gave a, a tour de force of an answer to your question, Gloria, um, but I'll add in a few more of the operational details about how this would be implemented. First, exactly as Rebecca described, a new administration is going to have to first and foremost face down our domestic challenges if it has any hope of rebuilding America's role in the world. So our deep and abiding hope would be that a new administration turns first to those domestic challenges and puts the full force of its effort behind remediating those so that it does have this chance to rebuild and remake America's role. Simultaneously, however, it should begin reaching out to friends and allies because it has no hope of implementing this strategy alone. So that means alerting allies not only of its intent to return to the global stage, but of the aspirations behind this strategy. Um, it means informing allies and partners of a desire to rebuild this international order that we've been talking about here today and beginning initiatives that will allow the United States and its friends to bring more governance to areas like climate change and cyberspace. And practically, this means three things on an operational level. 
First, the domestic reinvestments that we think are so important to the future of America's role in the world must come first. Whether that is uh, new investments in infrastructure or education um, or efforts to get Silicon Valley on board uh, with Washington's national priorities and improve their cooperation, a focus on the domestic determinants of American strength must be a priority right out of the gate. Number two, re-envisioning our foreign policy and the way we resource it. Exactly as we've been discussing here today, it will not be possible for the United States to retain and sustain an open world if it focuses unduly on defense and military spending. So right out of the gate, a new administration would have to prioritize refunding its State Department, reinvesting in international economic tools and in international development, and even remaking the way it uses intelligence because so much has changed in the world and the way we understand threats within it. The third pillar of all of this is, of course, its efforts to remake international order. So a new administration would have to reach out quickly to friends and allies to begin work on new regimes like a more rigorous climate regime or devising the rules that will govern cyberspace and the Internet. It won't have a luxury of picking and choosing between these areas, but only if it prioritizes domestic resilience and responses first will it have the ability to compete in all three areas, which will be so necessary on the road to come. Thank you. So um, one question about um, the, you mentioned the need for institutional reform at the WTO and other institutions. I don't know if it's something that could be undertaken in the aftermath of the pandemic. Do you see any need or opportunity for changing or creating new institutions, really completely new mechanisms, uh, where perhaps some of our existing major international institutions are not able to be salvaged or uh, it would be too difficult. So do you see any kind of major reform uh, opportunities globally? Absolutely. And let me just start uh, with the trade example that you just put forth. So we do have a legacy institution in the trade space, the World Trade Organization, uh, which doesn't have fully universal membership, but it does include almost all of the world's major economies and certainly the U.S., China, um, and many of our allies. The problem with the WTO, as Mira referred to earlier, is that it's a consensus-based organization. So if the WTO is to be the venue for, for instance, cracking down on Chinese intellectual property theft or illegal st state subsidies to Chinese companies and um, state-owned enterprises, then the Chinese are going to have to agree. And that's frankly going to be impossible uh, to achieve, at least in the near term. A similar challenge uh, besets the UN Security Council where the composition of the permanent membership of the Security Council reflects a distribution of power that obtained in 1945, but does not obtain today in 2020. However, the Security Council too operates by at least veto-based consensus, and therefore it is unlikely that we will be able to remake that body uh, unless Russia and China agree, and they are unlikely to do so. So what do we do when we are facing these kind of roadblocks at these organizations that have formidable legacies and have universal or near universal membership, uh, but that are really at loggerheads amidst uh, more great power disagreement. And the answer is to create new structures. And these structures are not going to be universal in membership. Uh, they're not even gonna be universal in coverage, which is to say that there will be different organizations and different configurations that address climate versus address technology versus address trade. But in the trade space, for instance, what this is going to mean is leading new high standards, multilateral trade agreements that enforce better labor standards, better environmental and climate standards, that enforce new technology standards, and to try to build large coalitions of states uh, that will back an open trading order. And at first, this will not include China, um, and it may not include a number of other important economies. But over time, we calculate that it will shift the incentives that countries like China face and therefore push them more in the direction of openness. So there are analogs in other areas. 
where sometimes we might want to use the G7 or the OECD or perhaps a new D10 type uh, consortium of democracies as a means of pushing forward with uh, new forms of governance. Um, and the fact is that the future of the international order is going to be patchwork in nature. So it will entail a lot of new bodies, none of which will be as ambitious in scope and membership as the UN was, uh, but will be more effective given the geopolitical environment that we find. You mentioned earlier, uh, you know, there was, we have an interest in seeing an open and wherever possible democratically based uh, world order based on countries who have uh, dem democratic uh, systems and so on. How, how do you come down from your perspective on the question of how interventionist the U.S. should be, how involved we should be in trying to either shape or preserve a democratic systems in other countries? Uh, what should, in the openness approach, how do we approach that question? It's really an essential query, Gloria, and it cuts right to the heart of how openness is a departure from some of the strategies that we've seen in the past, namely the post-Cold War world in which the United States had the luxury of promoting a liberal universalist strategy. Um, and let me explain a little bit about what I mean by that. In the immediate years following the end of the Cold War, there were so few great power competitors um, and hurdles to U.S. and allied aspirations that the United States and its like-minded allies were able to promote liberalism and democracy almost with no bounds. There was basically an operating assumption that countries would continue to become increasingly democratic and increasingly adopt liberal norms, such as those that govern human rights. But part of what has changed so fundamentally with China's meteor meteoric rise and the resurgence of countries like Russia, as well as democratic backsliding around the globe, is that unfortunately that liberal universalism is increasingly challenged. We believe, again, unfortunately, that Washington can no longer count on additional countries simply becoming democratic and adopting liberal values just by dint of the passage of time and progress. So as a result, Washington is going to have to adjust its aspirations. That means, number one, accepting, although we don't like it, that we're going to be living alongside some authoritarian competitors like China for a long time to come until their people choose otherwise. Number two, that has some implications for how we conduct policies like human rights, which should continue, of course, to be a cornerstone of the U.S. role in the world. The United States on human rights must lead by example, um, in addition to banding together with allies to try to enforce and uphold existing human rights law and international regimes that support it. But number three, the United States must increasingly realize that it's not going to be able to change the character of illiberal regimes by force. Unlike its failed expeditions um, in places like Iraq, we discourage the use of military intervention for the sake of regime change. Rather, we urge policymakers to adopt strategies that support democracies that do exist. That is funding diplomacy and other initiatives that might keep existing democracies from backsliding, but not trying to change the character of the regimes that are not today democracies. So in many ways, the role of democracy, human rights, and liberal values is more constrained in our vision, but ultimately we think it's more realistic and therefore more likely to succeed in this complex world that we're living in. And if I could just add one further point there, I would just point out that um, there are some concepts for the future of American strategy that rely upon only working with other democracies. And one of the innovations of our openness strategy is to recognize that by making the distinction between liberalism uh, and openness, we're going to be able to pick off some new partners who may not themselves be liberal democracies, but whose preferences and priorities do align with openness on discrete issues. So there you might think about Vietnam or Singapore, both of which are not liberal democracies themselves, but share American priorities in wanting to keep the Indo-Pacific region free and open as a matter of economics and as a matter of security. 
Not only that, but the United States is going to have to live alongside a more powerful and still authoritarian China. It's also going to have to find ways to cooperate with a powerful and authoritarian China as mutual interests may dictate. And we know that there is no solution to climate change or to global pandemics that doesn't include some form of cooperation between the US and China. So these countries are within the order. They can be discrete partners for openness. Uh, and this is not a strategy that rejects cooperation with any countries that are not themselves democracies, even though democracies are very much the focal point of our coalition building for openness. To dwell for a moment on China, a question from the audience, how does an openness strategy approach Beijing? Well, again, this is an important question that really motivates our strategy. As Rebecca noted in some of her earlier comments, China is sort of the pacing competitor that has inspired a lot of our thinking about openness, because the reality is that China is the only country on earth that has demonstrated both the capability and the will to potentially close off parts of Asia or even functional spaces like new technologies that could really allow it to develop closed areas of influence in the international system. Countries like Russia may aspire to these types of designs, but Moscow really doesn't have the capabilities to bring them about. So a lot of this strategy is designed with China in mind. But as we were just discussing in our last exchange about the role of liberal values and human rights, we also understand that China's rise means that unfortunately, we're not going to have the choice about whether or not we get to live alongside this stronger authoritarian regime. That is, this strategy is designed to protect American and allied interests in a world where we know we're likely to be living alongside a strong and author authoritarian China for some years to come. That is, until its people choose otherwise for the character of the regime. And this strategy is primarily competitive in its stance towards China, that is attempting to keep Asia open, keep the global commons like the South China Sea accessible, and even keep international technology governance open despite China's preferences for the contrary. Um, so in so many of these areas, our efforts are motivated by the desire to counteract China's instincts towards closure. But an important part of the strategy is that we are also willing to work with China, where China is willing to be governed by open principles and where our mutual interests align. That is, if China is willing to sign up to another round of climate change uh, governance, that is a Paris plus like agreement that would raise the ambitions of countries internationally, we think we should embrace the opportunity to do so. Likewise, if China was willing to improve the way it governs some of its own initiatives, like its Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative, if it was willing to apply international development standards and create a more transparent international institution, we might be willing to work with China there too. So although we see China as the primary competitor and antagonist towards openness, we also recognize that the realities of China's strength means that we will need to cooperate with China in key areas as mutual interests dictate. And we would intend to do so for the sake of obtaining the security and prosperity of American people, which is ultimately what we seek here with this strategy. Uh, Rebecca, any thoughts or? Uh, I thought that was a, a really comprehensive and masterful um, articulation of how China figures in here. I guess I would just add on um, maybe one illustrative dimension, which is something that I think might be of particular interest to the audience in the Bay Area, which is the US-China tech competition and what is at stake there. Because one of the key recommendations that we make in the book is that the US federal government needs to find a way to effectively bring its own tech sector back on sides. And there may be some in the audience who hear that and think that uh, their interests aren't actually aligned with an openness strategy or with US national security. Certainly there's been a lot of friction between the tech sector and the federal government. So one of the important points we make in the book is that the US simply cannot afford to lose the tech war with China. And we need to be very clear about what the United States is up against in this particular area. 
China has pioneered a model of digital authoritarianism that features lavish government investments in emerging technologies. It features national strategic coordination and direction, and it effectively fuses the civilian and the military spheres, not to mention propagating mass surveillance and in many ways human rights abuses um, at home. So if the U.S. does not compete with China in the ways that we've described and does not find a way to marshal its domestic innovation base to do so, a few things will happen. First, I think we can expect to see China achieve commercial dominance to the detriment of American companies who will find themselves decreasingly capable of uh, competing with Chinese companies, not only within China, but within a number of foreign markets, particularly as China gains the influence to set international technological standards um, and exert pressure on other countries to keep American companies out. I think that we'll see China writing new rules and standards that benefit the CCP and its companies, um, including in ways that kind of export in an extraterritorial way uh, certain elements of its own digital authoritarian model and the types of censorship that that entails, something that we've seen increasingly in the U.S., for example, the censorship of human rights advocates via Zoom. And third, I, there's a risk that we'll see China gain confidence in its own military technological superiority and potentially test that hypothesis through the use of military force in a way that is extremely dangerous to American interests and risks, frankly, catastrophic escalation. So I just want to take this opportunity to really make the case that those outcomes should be unacceptable to American tech firms who do want to compete with Chinese companies without bending to CCP rules, whether on tech transfer or or human rights. And that's going to be a really vital element of the geopolitical competition in the 21st century. And one where the US as a nation simply cannot succeed unless our private sector really comes in line with the public sector in service of these national strategies and aims. So another audience member wants to know, um, how would an open model impact our relationship with countries in the Middle East? Uh, they're asking about military agreements, which have been primarily with Israel, but there are some others as well. Um, how would you answer that? This is a really good question, um, which we appreciate. Part of what we are recognizing uh, with this openness strategy is in many ways a reprioritization um, of U.S. interests worldwide and implicitly a relative deprioritization of the Middle East, at least compared to where it has been in the past. Now, of course, what I mean by that is the fact that the United States has had two ongoing wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that have bogged down um, in the Middle East since 2001, and which, of course, most Americans now vehemently oppose. And despite efforts uh, by multiple administrations to extricate themselves from these so-called forever wars, it has proven so difficult to do so. Um, what we hope to encourage with the way that we think about the Middle East and our strategy is really to reduce the role of the military instrument in our interactions with the Middle East. Um, we would like to see the United States stop emphasizing the use of force first and foremost when it comes to the problems in the Middle East and actually reduce its ambitions a little bit with respect to what it can accomplish. We see very few countries in the Middle East that are actually capable of closing off significant portions of the world or important technological spaces like China can. And as a result, we think the United States does not need to bring to bear uh, things like military force to try to deal with rivals in the Middle East. Rather, it should be dealing with them primarily through diplomacy, through development aid, um, and through economic ties, which will allow it to reset its posture to that region without using the tools that are more likely to bog it down in other endless conflicts. The key exception here may be the fact that the United States will continue to need to be vigilant about Iran, um, in particular, the prospect of Iran moving closer closer again to developing a nuclear program, a nuclear weapons program, um, and also significantly Iran's ongoing interest in potentially closing off the Straits of Hormuz. An important part of our strategy is that we seek to keep the world's waterways open. So a lot of our focus on the Middle East is on working with allies and coalition partners to try to make sure the waters of the Middle East stay open and accessible for trade, for energy flows, and for the types of cooperation 
situation that we need to realize the strategy more broadly. But for our money, the Middle East needs to come down of it in its relative importance, in part to help the United States prevent the misadventures that it's experienced in recent years. Um, so uh, let's talk about implementation. Uh, the election happens one way or another. Uh, let's say that adoption of an open foreign policy is uh, a pillar of whichever administration. What are the first actions? What, what are the most important first steps? Well, to the extent that this is a strategy that really hinges on domestic renewal, we really have to start there. And first and foremost, the United States is going to have to get this pandemic under control um, to restore the most imminent in many ways threat to the safety and security of many Americans, and also to lead in an international coalition that will effectively be necessary to bring this pandemic under control. Because the fact is that the United States is not an island. And while strong and shrewd public health measures at home can certainly help, this is at the end of the day an international problem. Uh, we may see a vaccine that is developed first internationally to which the US will want to have access. And if we are to prevent future pandemics from grinding all of our lives and our economy to a standstill again, that's going to require a new and revitalized architecture of international cooperation. So everything sort of flows from that. But the other thing that the U.S. has to do, and it's something that we've mentioned already, but I think is really important as a pillar of domestic renewal, is to reinvest in our domestic innovation base, which is in many ways the cornerstone of American competitiveness. And what that means is reversing the long-term diminution of American investment in R&D and basic science that we've seen over the past several decades. Whereas in the 1970s, the federal government was investing 2% of GDP in R&D and basic science. Today, that number has dwindled below 1% to something on the order of 0.7%. And what that means is that we're not investing in the innovation of the future that will keep the United States economically competitive, but also competitive as a military matter. So one thing that we can do right off the gate is massive investment in R&D and basic science, while also investing in other elements of infrastructure that are absolutely critical to America's long-term competitiveness not only things like physical infrastructure like roads, but also digital infrastructure so that the United States economy can remain the engine of growth and productivity. Um, so there's a vast agenda and we've, we've talked about many different parts of it, but I think it's really clear that success begins at home and that's where we'll need to start in a new administration. So let me drill down on one very specific question. And this has been something we've come back to at the Commonwealth Club since the very beginning of the pandemic with everyone from uh, Dr. Fauci to, uh, to various other uh, former officials, Larry Brilliant and others. <clears throat> so we have a very specific problem with the transmission of viruses from animals to humans. And this is, originating to some degree in wet markets in China. This seems to me to be a very interesting case in point about how some very concerted international uh, collaboration is necessary to get to the root of what the problem that has brought about this pandemic and as well as some bird flus and other uh, viruses. How would you activate your approach to address this very specific problem that has given rise to this particular pandemic and that involves the difficult closed system in China? That's a really great question, Gloria, um, and a very challenging one, um, but we're glad to take it up in these final minutes. Um, I would say there's a few different dimensions to our answer. The first has to do with how we would like to see international global health governance improved. Um, but the second has to do with some of the causes of uh, these virus transmissions in the first place. Um, and those also fundamentally have implications for international order. So I'll take both of those pieces and then see if Rebecca would like to weigh in. 
First and foremost, while the United States um, and its allies and partners uh, have invested in the World Health Organization um, as the best response we have to global health crises, the United States, of course, uh, has withdrawn itself from the WHO at the height of this global crisis. And even before it decided to do so, the WHO is ultimately not a terribly strong international organization. It has some coordinating and convening power, um, but it's not nearly as as toothy as we would like it to be in moments of true crisis like the ones we have been experiencing. Um, so we would like to see the international global health regime beefed up to include mechanisms that are actually responsive to the type of crisis that we've been living through. That could include things like early warning systems positioned throughout regions that would result in allies and partners notifying one another of early disease outbreaks without waiting for individual governments like China to become fully transparent when we should have learned our lesson by now that they are not inclined to be in the first instance. It could also involve things like regional stock piles of medical supplies and PPE and ventilators um, so that when we do hit crisis moments again, we don't have to do an international scramble for these critical supplies, but rather know where they're located and can get them to where that they're most needed as quickly as is humanly possible. Um, there's a whole bunch of other prescriptions that we would like to see in this area too, but those are just two that could come out of a more robust international global health regime. But another point that I would make here that I think is critical is that when we think about the wet markets, we also have to think about what is causing those to happen in the first place. Wet markets are coming to be in part because of climate change and uh, other man-made actions that are stripping our natural environment of their abundant resources and bringing animals that are not generally supposed to be around one another into close contact. Um, so we might think about how the future of climate governance should govern the way we exploit and sell animals um, as well as plants from our environment and what the consequences of those might be for humans down the road. Um, so I would say that we have to think of this problem certainly as much bigger than China, while also not assuming that this closed Chinese regime is going to become sufficiently transparent anytime soon. But Rebecca, I'd welcome any thoughts you might like to add. Well, cognizant of the fact that our time is almost up here, um, I guess I would just use this as an example of the way in which um, when the United States doesn't lead on the international stage, nobody else will. And we've seen this with really tragic clarity over the course of this year thus far, where not only did uh, Chinese negligence allow uh, this virus to break out and to spread as quickly as it did um, and to go undetected and unreported for far too long, but also given what in many ways was sort of the opportunity, certainly of, of the decade, let's say, for China to step up and take up the mantle of global leadership in COVID response, it bungled that opportunity. It alienated uh, potential allies and partners. It was coercive and derisive in its diplomacy, uh, including its global health outreach. And what that really goes to show is that we can't rely on other great powers to do this work, to marshal international coalitions, to uh, respond to the future pandemics that, because of climate change, are all but inevitable. So this really, at the end of the day, is a call to action. Because if the U.S. does not take up this openness strategy, if it does not embrace a vision of future American foreign policy that is, on the one hand, more disciplined than the one we've seen over the past several decades, but also far more globally engaged and cooperative than the one the Trump administration has pursued, then we're going to see rampant disorder. And disorder means that the pandemic that we're living through right now may actually just be a mild harbinger of much worse dangers that are still to come. I think that couldn't be a better answer to how your strategy could help lead us out of the difficulty that we're in right now and how our lack of stepping out and taking a leadership role has led us to where we are. We simply have to resolve this issue uh, with closure, nationalism, rejection of expertise.
communities and step out to lead on the world stage. So you're right, we are at the uh, the tail end of our program. It's been wonderful talking with you. Uh, and I'm going to ask you one more question. And this is a specific one from Rebecca, but please, Mira, feel free to chime in as well. And it's from our audience. Rebecca, as part of the Naval War College, what are you teaching future military leaders that could help implement your ideas? I'm delighted for this question because it gives me an opportunity to say that everything that I have said today and that Mira has said for that matter, we are saying only in our personal capacity and it does not represent the US government or any institution with which we are affiliated. Um, so part of the purpose of the Naval War College where I teach um, is to teach our future military leaders how to think strategically. Um, often when people come into the military, they um, enter into very specialized professions and become exceptionally good at doing the thing that they have chosen or been assigned to do. Uh, but it's much harder to zoom out, to expand their aperture, to think historically and to think strategically about not just where we are today, but where our nation is going going and how the military and individual service members can help us to get there. So the core mission of the Naval War College and the one that I take very seriously is to try to impart those lessons, to teach them to think critically and you know, question conventional wisdom, to situate our current moment within a broader historical arc, and to think about particularly as they assume leadership roles within the U.S. military, um, how they can confront a relentlessly dynamic world and advance American interests within it. Gloria, I'm happy to just chime in with a final thought um, to, to embroider on Rebecca's beautiful answer. When I interact with students and other young people, um, particularly with respect to the work that Rebecca and I have been doing together for these past years, I always try to impress upon them the fact that we are at a moment of extraordinary international change. And as Rebecca put it, extraordinary international opportunity, much as it might look like destruction and devastation from where many of us sit right now. These opportunities and moments don't come along very often. In prior eras, they were the moments um, you know, at the conclusion of the First World War or the Second World War or the end of the Cold War. But unlike some of these other prior moments, this one is happening without a clash between major power militaries like we might have seen in the past. Nonetheless, we are experiencing international disarray on a level that many of us have not seen in our lifetime. But rather than simply get despondent about this moment, we hope that um, the talk we've been having here today and some of the ideas we've shared are cause for optimism. And that is to say that the United States, if it works with friends and allies and through international institutions, still has the power and the opportunity to reshape this moment for good. And if it can draw upon history and strategy and sound policy to do so, not only can it remain powerful to, for years to come, but it can help to remake a better world than the one we are living through this year. So certainly we hope that's what we'll see in the years to come. Well, I'd like to thank you, Mira, and you, Rebecca, for the work you're both doing at Yale Law School and the Naval War College, uh, the thoughts you're giving to this extremely important topic, how eloquently you're writing and speaking about it. And I look forward to your long careers of contribution as leaders in the foreign policy field. Thank you. And thank you for being with us today. Um, our thanks again to Rebecca Listener, Assistant Professor at the U.S. Naval War College, and Mira Rapp Hooper, Senior Fellow at Yale Law School, who are the co-authors of the new book, An Open World, How America Can Win the Contest for 21st Century Order. Of course, you can get their book uh, at your local bookstore or online. We thank our viewing audience and those who will uh, watch this in, in later weeks and months. And now we say goodbye to our audience at the Commonwealth Club and to our wonderful speakers. Thank you.